Well, good morning, church. I think I'm on here. Before we uh, continue our service of honoring the graduates and the uh, young people of our congregation, let's uh, spend a minute, and I'm going to ask us to do our prayer time for the uh, search committee a little bit different. They've got some significant time that they're going to be investing on your behalf in the next couple weeks, so let's just pause and, and have a moment of silence, and then I'll, I'll close our time for prayer. But if you, uh, you we want to pray that, you know, one, that God would protect their time, their heart, their energy. Um, because they're going to have some, some, some days here in the, in the coming weeks and just going to really need our prayers. So let's spend a few, few seconds of, of silent prayer, and then I'll lead us in prayer. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we celebrate you today, and I thank you for these people at Elmdale Baptist Church who are faithfully holding out a candle of, of light to the world around them. I thank you that their footprint on this corner um, is significant, important, and has the capacity to, to revolutionize this portion of Springdale and, and actually the world, Father, and I'm thankful for that. Father, these people have been faithfully praying, faithfully seeking your will, faithfully being patient, and I pray that you continue to honor that. I thank you that we can make plans, but Father, ultimately it's your plans that succeed. And so we pray, Father, for our committee, the search committee, as they, as they labor in the next couple weeks, the significant time that they're going to invest on the behalf of the people here. I pray that you give them strength, you give them encouragement. Father, I pray that you give them discernment, and most of all, Father, I pray that you give them peace. I, Father, I pray we've, we've entrusted them with, with an incredible decision and, and an incredible process. And I pray, Father, that they would be, uh, feel the weight um, of the, and the force of the prayers and the support of the people in these pews. We celebrate you today, Father, and we thank you for your loving kindness. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so i uh, going to continue on celebrating our graduates today. So, young people, I hope you always pay attention, but I hope you pay attention more today, maybe. I kind of think back of my graduate years and think of the milestones that they were and thought about how important some of the life events were. I mean, that year, Michael Jackson uh, released the, the uh, Thriller album. The top movies were E.T., which was great, right? Uh, Chariots of Fire, Gandhi, and Tootsie. Don't forget that one. Um, on the history scene, John Hinckley was found not guilty by reason of insanity for shooting the president. And uh, Jimmy Connors defeated John McEnroe. And this, was, this is interesting. The year I graduated high school, MRI machines were released for public use in Europe. And we followed after that soon after. So, you know, we use them all the time now. The Space Shuttle Columbia sent its first mission the year. But bigger than those world events and those music were the things that God began to do in my life. Those years were milestone years for me, as they were for most of you. There's a reason why we pause and celebrate graduates, because it's sort of a, our culture's way of launching young men and young women into adulthood. And while that seems easy, um, really it is the beginning of a journey. And as I think back on my journey, and some of you would suggest that I'm still on my journey to adulthood, but um, as, as we launch our students and we launch our graduates, we think about what they may learn about their place in the world and what they may learn about God's design for them and their fit. I can recall a great deal um, of the, the moments that I realized, okay, this is the next phase, this is the next chapter. And, and in, specifically, I can recall two men that invested a lot of time and energy in me and the difference they made in my life. And I was able to recall as an eighth grader, ninth grader, these, these senior adult men who picked me up on Saturdays and, and Tuesdays and, and invested time and energy in my life and what that meant for me. 
And so as we think about that, um, I, I, I often think we fail to pass on the advice that, that this wealth of knowledge has in this room. There's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot that you have to offer. So Wednesday night, I asked the attendees to share some advice that we could give our graduates today. And so I, I don't want to just... I don't want to just say graduates, I want to say young people, okay? And I'm going to define young as under 30, and here's why. So if you're 30 and you go, I'm not young anymore. Well, scientifically we know, and especially for men, that the part of our brain that makes decisions, that, that kind of we get our value judgments from, that part of our brain is still developing 26, 27, 28, 29. So let's just define young as under 30. So if you're 30 and you have sage wisdom, great, I love that. If you're under 30, there's chances are you still have some development to go in your brain. So if that's the case, and let's just use that, we'll, we'll target under, under 30 young, over 30, you're over the hill, okay? So some of you think, well, why waste a morning doing that? Well, let me remind you two things. One, it's, it's only one of 52 Sundays, and we get a chance to celebrate the youth of our church. So let's, let, it, it's worth doing. Secondly, there's some really important information about young people that are growing up in our evangelical churches today. There's statistics out there that suggest that once they graduate, they leave church and don't come back, and I'll, I'll show that to you in a minute. So we don't often stop and to pause and think about our role in developing our young people. We give that to our children's pastor and our youth pastor and youth workers and say, hey, you do it. But the reality is it's supposed to be a joint project. The scriptural uh, precepts are that old teach young, old pass on to youth. The older invest in, the older inquire, the older model, the older spend time with, and that's God's design. It's the way it's supposed to be. And so today, let's pause and talk about our graduates. Look at this first slide. LifeWay research um, data shows that 70% of young adults who indicated they attended church regularly for at least one year in high school do, in fact, drop out. There are some statistics that say it's like 83%. However, this one reflects the most recent research that suggests at some point about 13 14% of them come back that we didn't count on. The interesting thing about that, the students that drop out once they leave the folds of our church, um, so the ones that are coming back, they're doing so later in life when they have kids. All of a sudden, those little dominoes, and they remember, oh, wait, maybe I should be back in church. And so we also know that people are getting married later, so that's actually even further prolonging when the students come back to church. But here's what they said works. The kids that come back are that stay involved. Statistically, there are four determining factors. Look at the first one. I wanted, to, uh, wanted the church to help guide my decisions in everyday life. There's value in the church in everyday decisions. The second one was my parents were still married to each other and both attended church. That's big. Thirdly, the pastor's sermons were relevant to my life. They were bigger and broader than just Sunday after Sunday, same old, same old. And fourthly, at least one adult from church made a significant investment in me personally and spiritually between ages of 15 and 18. The four reasons why our young people, the minority, by the way, that come back to church are right there. The four reasons why our youth of today that decide that church matters to them, that stay involved and stay equipped, are right there. Now, I hear that 70% drop out after they graduate. Wow. Wow. We spend a lot of money in our churches today to have those kind of results. Listen to Proverbs chapter 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple and knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And listen to this in verse 8 and 9. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. 
They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to or, or adorn your neck. So what kind of sage advice are you moms and dads? What kind of sage advice are we as the adults of the church giving our young people today? Well, I'll show you the first slide. I asked the first question I asked, Ross, if you want to change it to the next one. Oh, you, you can barely read that, but I'll read them to you. Don't worry. Um, the first question I ask is, what do you wish you knew now or knew then what you know now, right? So you think about that for a minute. If I ask you, what do you wish you knew when you graduate that you know now? Here are the answers. Who I really was. The value of balance. Uh, I wish I knew that I didn't know everything, right? I was not immune to temptation. I wish I knew that life was going to get real. I wish I knew how important grades were. I wish I knew how to do the laundry. Moms, we got to do a better job of teaching, right? I wish I knew how important God really is. I wish I knew what job was in store for me. I wish I knew God better. I wish I knew you can move on from stereotypes and disappointments. The world, pause there for just a minute. The world begins early on in junior high and high school and on into college to put us in a box. We want to define each other. We want to give each other a label. That's the sports guys. That's the band geeks. Those are the, the skateboarders. Those are the smokers. Those are the choir, choir people. And that's the most likely to succeed. And that's the cheerleader. And that's the jock. And we want to put people in a box. And when we get older, we, we want to do the same thing. And what an important, important idea that you can move on from stereotypes and disappointments. I wish I knew how strong I really was. There's so much doubt in youth. I wish I knew how smart my parents really were. Parents? <laughs> yeah. I wish I could do more than play sports. Uh, I wish I knew what job I would enjoy. I wish I knew what I know now. Yeah. I wish I knew that a good trade was as good as college. I wish I knew that life did not owe me anything. And I wish I knew that God created each person for a specific purpose. Wow. So you think about the, the advice that you can pass on to our young people. I wish I knew. Listen to this verse in Proverbs 16. We can make our plans, but the Lord gives the right answer. When we're 18, when we're 22 and graduating from college or high school, we think we know it all. We don't. You have wisdom and advice to share on I Wish I Knew. The second one I asked was uh, the biggest surprise after graduation. The, the biggest surprise was the, uh, the huge awakening that I didn't know as much as I thought, right? You wake up one day after graduation and go, wow, I'm not really as smart as I thought I was. Uh, somebody said that I wish uh, the biggest surprise was that I was not the center of the universe, uh, another said um, that I wish the biggest surprise was the world was against me and the ways of God. Another said the biggest surprise was the worldliness of people at college. Okay. One, one said uh, the biggest su surprise was I still have to clean my room. One said the biggest surprise was becoming a parent. One said the biggest surprise is bills are bigger and come more often than when you leave home. Right? One said the biggest surprise that it was up to me to get up and go to class, to go to work. It was up to me. One said the biggest surprise was the realization I was on my own. I love the next one. The biggest surprise was I need a job and in exclamation said yikes. One said the biggest surprise was paying bills. One said the biggest surprise was how good I had it at home, how good the food was, and how wise my parents were. One said the biggest surprise was I needed to earn money to survive. Another said that getting away from home wasn't all that great. One said the biggest surprise was being without parents made it harder to be motivated to study, clean, etc. One said the biggest surprise was that my mom was a bigger supporter than I knew. 
Listen to this verse in Proverbs 16. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Most, most assuredly, life takes us in different directions, right? Most assuredly, we plan our road and we plan our steps, but God has a unique way of surprising us. God has a unique way of bringing new when there's old. God has a unique way of being around the corner and introducing something else. We make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Uh, third question I asked was, the biggest spiritual growth after graduation, what, what did God do in your life that was significant? One of them was, I needed God more than ever. There was an insatiable burning of saying, I need God. One said, the meaning of lordship, what that meant. Third biggest spiritual growth was learning not to rely on the faith of my parents, but my own faith and belief. And let me just pause there for a minute. Uh, growing up as a PK, you know, a lot of people just assumed that I had the faith of my dad. And they, they would ascribe my life in the way they viewed faith and, and, and service in the way they saw my dad. And it was a long time before my faith became mine, became uniquely mine. And, and I think that, that as we grow, everyone has to remember that our, our, our faith is ours. It has to be real to us. My parents' salvation doesn't get me salvation in heaven. My parents' belief doesn't get me belief here on earth. It becomes mine. Another, uh, this, this is great. After graduation, remember the biggest spiritual growth? Accepting Christ. At least one person responded they became a believer after graduation. One was finding out God was really interested in me. What a great piece of advice. God is interested in us. Another one was that uh, spiritual growth was that realizing people are really praying for me. Realizing I am not the center of the universe, but I do matter to God. So that goes along with the first one. I wish I knew that I wasn't the center of the universe, but the spiritual growth was I may not be the center of the universe, but I matter to God. Everybody matters to God. The last one was that God is teaching me how to love another person selflessly. That's a big spiritual growth moment, isn't it? When you wake up and realize that I'm to serve, I'm to wash feet, I'm to live out my life looking for opportunities to give and invest in others. Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. The next area of advice I asked was the one certainty that wasn't certain after all, right? Now, I'll share mine because it's not on this list, and I, I shared it by way of example. Growing up in a Baptist preacher's home, everybody that danced was going to hell. I was certain of it when I graduated. I'm not certain of that anymore, okay? <laughs> right now, you may still hold that, that, that truth. I, I don't. I have some friends that enjoy dancing, and I know I'm going to spend eternity with them. Okay, so that was, that was the idea and the concept. So the one certainty that, that wasn't certain after all for you young people is that I was ready. Eh. Okay? Another certainty was that I would be successful in every endeavor. Maybe not. The one certainty is that friends are forever. And this is a practical one. My nice truck that soon got wrecked certainties. I would finish college before I had kids. That college was going to be just like high school. That life was going to get easier. That I was grown up. That I had it under control and didn't need God. That dad's money spent easier than my money. I was certain that I could do whatever I want when I graduated. I was certain that bad things won't happen to me. I was certain that my parents would live forever. I, I was certain that I knew what was best for me. I was certain that I was the best judge of who someone else is or was. I was certain that my career path, what I was going to be or not. I was certain that everything doesn't just always work out. And those things have a way of unraveling. The certainty of that I'm the best judge or that everything's going to be nice and work out. And that 
Friends are forever. Those certainties have a way of dissolving over time. And listen to this, Proverbs. You can make many plans. They could be certain. But the Lord's purpose will prevail. Proverbs 19, 21. The next thing I ask is the one piece of advice I received or wish I had received. Okay, so this is thinking back to the year you finished school. What great piece of advice did you get or wish you would have got? One of them was truth can hurt and lies scar. One of them was honor your father and mother. One of them was don't be in a hurry. A good piece of advice. One was let God be the first place person you turn to for help. One was be respectful and do your best. Simple but true. Uh, one piece of advice they wish they would re receive was to, to follow through with school. One was to take risk, have fun, and remember whose you are. I love that. One was to watch your debt and stay away from credit cards. Young people, are you listening? One was to find a church in light of the fact that 70% leave. What a great piece of advice. One was you can't do it all. Another piece of advice was be proud of who you are. God made you. You're not special, but you are unique. You're wired uniquely by God's design. Be proud of that. Uh, one was pick a degree that allows for more opportunities. One piece of advice was if your dreams don't scare you, they might not be big enough. Another piece of advice is, in this one, parents, soon you will be able to do and handle your own taxes. Lord willing, right? And the last piece of advice I love, stay in the word, stand firm. Sage wisdom for our young people. Listen to Proverbs 15, 22. Plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. So for the young people of our church, get advice, seek advice. Seek, seek the counsel and the wisdom of those around you. The last one I asked was any regrets. And here they are. Not enough on the right education. One person said, had too many to write. One regret was that they were too timid. One regret was not finishing college before starting a family. One regret was that I didn't study harder. I love this one from a vet, a veteran, I should say. No regrets. That's cool, isn't it? One was, I should have won my friends to the Lord. Yeah. One was not staying in touch with my classmates. One was letting others influence who I, who I was supposed to be. One was that I took myself too seriously or not taking my parents' advice. One was that I should have worked harder in school. One was that I was not more outgoing. Regrets are funny. Some people carry them around like baggage the rest of their life. Some people have none. One way we can eliminate and make that list shorter for our young people today is share the wisdom that you have from yesterday. It's interesting going to your 10, 20, and 30 year high school reunion and listen to the regrets of your friends. I'm not one that has a lot. I, I'm, I just don't, but I have friends that, that regret it, that regret the way they've spent much of their adulthood, regret the way they spent some of their childhood. We have hope to offer as Christ followers to our young people. Let's be about doing it. Listen to Job 26.3. How you enlightened my stupidity. What wise advice you have offered. It's nice to give wise advice. So, some simple, some sound, some serious, and some silly. But all, the, all these words came from people in this congregation who are on their journey and can look back and say, I wish somebody had taken the time when I graduated to share these with me. These things really matter. So church, it's, it's kind of simple, but in context, that's what we're supposed to be about. In Proverbs, we're really quick to read that our kids are supposed to listen to us and to listen to our advice and pay attention. And young people, that's true. 
do that. But I think the part that we often miss is that the older are compelled to share. The older are compelled to invest. The older are compelled to pour their lives into the younger. So I ask you, older, are you doing that? How are you measuring up at investing in the lives of those under 30? For the under 30s, life changes, but you don't have to walk it alone. The Bible says if we seek wisdom from God, we will get it. There are those who have gray hair or no hair that, that uh, maybe you don't know how to engage or don't know how to gauge you. Invite them to dinner, show up with cookies, mow their yard, do something to build a relationship. For those of us over 30, I know the under 30 sometimes dress weird. They listen to weird stuff that they call music. Um, they constantly look at their phones but they have the same fears and concerns that you had when you were 18, when you were 22. They have the same uncertainties and certainties that perhaps you had. What can you do? How can you engage them and equip them to give them wise guidance and proverb that Proverbs talked about? The implication is simple. Do it. It's God's way. Let's stand and pray a blessing over our young people. And if you're here today and perhaps been thinking about joining our church we'd love to have you steve will be here to meet you perhaps you have regrets that you need to come pray about or you see a young person that you've been meaning to speak to you can use this